Chef Hawks here again, and so now we are looking at chapter 19, yeast breads. Uh, so this is as opposed to things like quick breads um, that are something that we use a chemical um, leavener in. On this one, we're using yeast as our leavening agent, as our agent that makes our bread rise. So let's dive in here. So what is yeast? So yeast is a living organism. Um, it's actually a form of mold. Um, it acts as the leavener because it will consume the sugars that are in uh, whatever we're baking, which uh, generally, if you have flour in your bread, um, then it will actually eat the sugar that's naturally in there. Some breads we actually add a touch of sugar to as well, uh, and that just helps that yeast to eat that so that it can uh, then start to produce carbon dioxide and alcohol, which is all part of that fermentation process. And it makes our, all of our baked goods rise. So we have two different types of doughs uh, that we generally make. We have lean doughs, we'll talk about those in a minute, and rich doughs. Um, and so generally the mixture of dough is a mixture of flour, some form of liquid, and the leavener, in this case, our yeast. Other ingredients that we can add in there as well can add color, flavor, and texture, things like nuts, grains, fruits, vegetables, honey, molasses, herbs, and spices. Uh, we can also add things like cheeses as well um, and oils that just add more flavor and texture to the bread and, and can make it so dramatically different from each other. So the actual dough itself should be stiff but pliable uh, in order for us to be able to work it. So let's first of all take a look at lean dough. So lean dough generally just has flour, yeast, water, and salt to taste. Uh, there's generally no sugar or fat added to it. Um, it normally has a chewy texture with a crisp crust. So things like French bread that we can see in the picture here where it has that crisp crust on the outside and a chewy, uh, uh, chewy texture to the inside of it uh, or, and, or various other hard rolls as well. So the characteristics of lean dough, it's low in sugar, chewy texture, crisp crust, and includes things like French bread, baguettes, batards, pain de pie, uh, kaiser rolls, Italian bread, and hard rolls. And then let's look at rich dough. So the rich dough still has the flour, yeast, water, and salt as the main base, but then what we do, we're actually adding possibly shortening or other tenderizing ingredients. Uh, that can include things like butter, it can be sugars, syrups, um, and it can be eggs, milk, and cream. Uh, all of these things give it more of a cake-like texture as opposed to that more firm bread type of texture. So things like Parker House Rolls and Danish are good examples of this. So just to confirm on here, so um, the rich doughs are higher in fat and sugar. They may contain milk, eggs, and cream. So always bear in mind if someone has allergies, these types of rich doughs may be a problem for them. Um, and they generally have a soft cake-like texture as opposed to that firmer bread texture. Uh, so things like Parker House rolls, clover leaf rolls, soft rolls, Danish and cinnamon rolls are all part of that family. And so now let's talk a little about sourdough. Uh, you may have seen or heard about it. It's become a little more, a little more fashionable again. Uh, this is actually something that's been around for a long, long time throughout our history. This is some of our original style of bread uh, that was created. And instead of using um, just either dried or fresh uh, yeast, uh, back a couple of thousand years ago, that wasn't necessarily something that was available, that was separated out as something being that you just purchased by itself. So what we actually have to do to create our leavener is we create what we call a starter. So that's a mixture of water um, and flour 
and we're using actually some natural yeast which tends to be in the flour as long as it's unbleached um, and in the air itself it's it's buzzing all around us um, so we can make these amazing uh, breads but they take a little longer to do because we actually have to culture some of the natural yeast that's in our in our general vicinity uh, we ferment it it gives it a slight sour smell that's the alcohol uh, and the carbon dioxide that's being produced by the natural yeast that's in there um, and that will serve as our leavening agent uh, to be our yeast as we develop it ourselves as opposed to just buying it so some of the characteristics of sourdough now uh, so it's made with a starter and we're going to take a look at that in just a moment um, it has that slight sour flavor not an unpleasant flavor but a slight sour flavor um, and then it has a dense more chewy texture to it with a firm crust uh, so this includes things like country loaves rye loaves san francisco sourdough and german pumpernickel so let's take a look first of all at how we make our sourdough starter. Um, this uh, this gentleman here does an amazing job um, at his pr uh, production. So let's take a look and see exactly how we do it. It's very simple. So what we want to do now is we want to show you how to make some sourdough bread. Sourdough got quite fashionable. It's quite trendy. It's on a lot of restaurant menus. Sourdough is trendy since about 5,000 BC the oldest form of leavened bread. So why we all think that we have a big tradition with soda bread, or your granny might have made it, this is what her granny's granny used to make. This is what we're all trying to get back to. So the big revolution, the big future in food, the future in bread, is about going back. It's about going back to the past. And this is what we're trying to get back to. Beautiful, beautiful sourdoughs, naturally fermented. We got our seeded sourdough, we got our rye, we got our malt house. As I say, you get a hundred different types. What we need in order for us to make some sourdough bread is to make our sourdough starter our sourdough culture. The process is very, very simple. It's simply just a mix of flour and water. So we have about 50 grams of flour, and to that we're adding 50 mils of water. We stir it together, and that is simply it. So now what we're going to do is you leave that cup to sit out in your kitchen, just gently covered, ambient temperature overnight for about 12 hours. So at the moment we're surrounded by wild yeast. It's a good strain of bacteria. It exists everywhere. You breathe it in every day. And then basically over a process of using simply just flour and just water, it eventually picks up that bacteria in the air. And that bacteria starts to ferment. It starts to live off the protein within the flour. So it starts to rise and collapse. Realistically, it takes about seven or 10 days to make it. But for a lot of people I know, I say I'm not making a loaf of bread, it takes seven or 10 days to make it. But the idea is once you get up and going once, that's virtually about it. As long as you don't use it all, you'll never run out. So realistically, you only ever have to do this one time in your life. So, we mix it together, flour and water. And then, 12 hours later, it looks a little bit like this. So at this stage, we will be due to mix this, another 50 grams of flour and another 50 grams of water. Stir it together, and that's it. Again, we let it sit overnight. Day three, we repeat the process. And then on day four, you can already see it's starting to become lovely and bubbly. You can see all these little bubbles becoming lovely and active. And this is the sign of life starting to form. This is exactly what we're looking for. It's starting to ferment. It's all the good things in life. Wine, beer, cheese, bread, all based on the same principle. So you will find a sour take on it and a kind of sweet kind of vinegary smell. But don't worry, it's exactly what we're looking for. And if you find a little bit of liquid starting to come away from it, don't worry about that either. Just pour it straight back in. So we're going to give this another day and I'm going to feed it again. And one more time. And then by the time it's ready, I'm possibly, I'm most likely on about day seven. But don't worry if you find that maybe on quite day six or day seven, it's not exactly there yet. Don't be afraid to give it an extra day because it will differ depending on the environment in which it's kept in. So if it needs an extra day, just give it an extra day. But now we've got our lovely, active sourdough. It's got that little lovely vinegary smell. You can see it kind of right, it's been rising up the glass. This would have started about here earlier on. And now it's climbed up here. So it'll continue to rise, and then it will drop back down. So at this stage, it's basically ready to go. Well, if I'm completely honest, this is day two, this is day four, and this is year nine. So I've had this for nine years. So as long as I don't use it all, I'll never run out. So all I'll simply do, for example, after we make our bread today, 
I'll have 200 grams left over. I will simply stir in 200 flour, 200 water, and tomorrow it's ready to go again. Because I keep mine at room temperature, I have to feed mine every day. But for the home baker, we might only bake maybe once a week or a weekend, so a bit more time. It can become quite an expensive pet to keep, to keep feeding this thing every day. So what you can simply do is just keep yours in the fridge. Um, because it's based on bacteria, cold won't kill it, it'll just slow it down. So for example, you're going to bake it on a Saturday morning. Take it out of the fridge on a Friday. Just leave it sitting in your kitchen, just to take the chill off it. That evening, save whatever weight you have, for example, um, 200 grams. Stir in 200 flour, 200 water, leave it sitting in your kitchen. Next morning it's going to be lovely and bubbly, lovely and active, ready to make your bread. Take what you need to make your bread, whatever's left over, back in the fridge, that's it. So we've a little once a week cycle. And you find it kind of gets better with age, the flavour starts to develop. So even if you're not baking, you still have to feed it, because technically it is alive. So if you're building up too much, just bin some away, just keep back enough to keep it going. And the easiest ratio to work off is whatever weight you have here, same way to flour, same way to water. Could not be simpler. Okay, so that shows us exactly how we make our sourdough starter. So that's going to be our leavening agent. That's where we're grabbing in all of that natural yeast from, from our environment um, to have our leavening agent. So now I have this video. It's a little bit longer, but so we're not going to watch it in entirety. But just so you see how we make the dough, um, I'm going to uh, show you this. This is Brad and Claire with Bon Appetit. Uh, they have a great test kitchen up in New York. And they can show us how we then take that starter and we use that as the leavening agent in part of our dough. Hi guys, hello. I oh, know we'll do that again. <laughs> hello. All right, today on It's Live, it's getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to be doing bread, sourdough, for our Claire. And she's a little bit more of the professional with the bread making process. <laughs> no, um, yeah, use this. Yeah, we might. And. Uh, <laughs> So, like when you made kombucha, and I really just want, oh god, oh god, you had a scoby. Yes. So the starter a symbiotic is like, community of bacteria and yeast. Exactly. So starter is to sourdough as scoby is to kombucha. The life. So is. yes. So I have starter here. It is essentially only a mixture of flour and water but it's been inoculated with all of these yeast and bacteria from the air. You can make starter at home, but I really recommend going to a bakery that you know is doing like nice artisanal loaves and asking for a little bit. I'm sure they'll give it to you. Make some friends, you know, it's like the community, you know, you open up and they will open up to you. Yeah, before you bake sourdough, you need to feed the starter. That's something you hear people say, it's like, sounds like they have a pet at home. It's kind of like that. Kind of. Essentially what that means is you give it more water and flour, you're gonna feed it. So put the starter in the bowl. Yeah, but you're only gonna use two tablespoons. So every time you feed starter, you only need a little bit of starter and then a proportionately much greater amount of flour and water. That looks pretty good. Measure out about 250 grams of water. 250. All right, Vinny, you tell me when. <laughs> Two what? 250. Ah, 257. That's okay. It doesn't so. matter as much how much water as long as you add the exact so same amount of flour. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now give it a stir. The idea here is to break up the starter that's in there and distribute it in the water. All right. And that's why you add water first. Get the gang going. It's just easier to mix. Now we're going to do 57 grams of flour. 257. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> okay, that's bread flour. That's just white bread flour. White flour is good for starter, but what's really good for starter is whole wheat. The yeast and bacteria like to feed on a lot of the things that are in the bran. And we're feeding it a better diet. Yes, oh, I'm into a that. more rounded diet. 2018. So we kind of right. split the difference and go half so light, half. So that's a buck 25 and a buck 20, 31, <laughs> 32. Yeah, 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 there you go. Look at me, huh? <laughs> okay. And you don't need to over mix it. The idea is really just to hydrate the flour. And it's going to do its own little funky thing. Yeah. <laughs> So it can look kind of shaggy. Yeah, just no dry spots. It's a good idea to actually go through a couple of different rounds of feeding before you bake, which like really activates these yeast and bacteria and gets them like ready to go. Tomorrow we're going to end up using one that I fed a couple of different times. All right, so uh, tune in tomorrow. Oh no, we'll be back here tomorrow. <laughs> 
All right, guys, we're back here day two of the sourdough making process. We noticed it changed a bunch of a lot of act bubbles there. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, what are we going to be doing, Claire? So today we're going to mix the dough with our starter. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is make sure that our starter is ready to go. We test that with something called a float test. And so it's fermented enough yeah. in that 12 hours. Yeah. Oh, she's floating. Oh. Well, and that maybe is a little bit of a big piece. <laughs> I've been <any> cut. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, you know, it's, not ready. it's not ready. <laughs> no, we have to wait longer. But that's okay. That's okay because well, that's good. So we that... have to simultaneously do a step called auto leaf. So okay. auto leaf basically means you mix all the flour with the water or a portion of the water and let it sit. So auto leaf encourages gluten development. We're going to use mostly white flour for gluten. Okay, how much? Start with 750 of that. We're going to add in some other flour, so it'll be 1,000 grams total. Top it off with another 150 of that's whole wheat bread. Okay, and then the last 100. So this is felt flour. It just produces cool flavor with the starter. How much water do we need? So we're going we're gonna to start with 750, and then we're going to add a little more water later. So this is just flour water. We haven't yet added the starter or the salt. So yeah, we're going to cover this up, our auto leaves, and then we're going to wait 30 minutes, and we'll check. We'll do another little float test on the starter. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be ready to go. Before, you know, Vinny came along, we uh, did a little sample and it floated. Maybe we'll do another one for the, uh, yeah. for the sake of uh, security. Place it in the old water. <laughs> no, no, it just floated. It or anything think that when you put it down on the counter, maybe pop some of the bubbles? <laughs> Boom. Float. Mm, yeah. Well, float, yeah. Mm. Should I grab some of the other starter? It worked. It's a little tiny piece. It's just a little bit. I think we were going a little aggressive with the sides there. <laughs> Sunk like a brick. <laughs> that was actually the worst one. Old Magic Fingers Vinny over there did one before we started rolling, that worked. and uh, and it floated like a raft. Vinny, maybe uh, we'll switch real quick. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, see, float, float. So we can go ahead and add that. This. Yeah, really. We're gonna add twenty five percent by weight starter. So with a thousand grams of flour, it's pretty easy. Two fifty of starter. Right. And that's all we'll need. What happened? Did you double wrap this? You did it. Oh, oh wait, 200. I, I misspoke. I think today we're going to go 200, so it'll be a bit of a slower fermentation. For the less starter, the longer, longer it'll take to ferment. So why don't we add more? Because you don't always want, don't you don't want it to go faster necessarily, because you want flavor development. Right. Time flavor, flavor. Time equals flavor. I might need a bigger bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 200 on the top, baby. <laughs> So this we're going to add to yep, this. Yep, and there's a special way to incorporate it, which I'll show oh. you. So I learned this on the internet because I've done a lot of Googling about bread. We pinch it in. Oh, pinchy. So like this. So this is where you're really going to kind of get in there. Sprinkle this on there, and then that water goes on top. And this just makes it easier to mix that salt in. Oh, wow. So this Everything kosher really salt, changed. sea salt, yeah. The salt changes texture like crazy. It becomes much more elastic. Have you done this before, Brad? Done what before? Made, made bread dough. No, well, yeah. Well, there was that time we shot Actually, the entire yeah, episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we don't even know how many hours it's been. We lost count. What do you think? Oh, I think it's great. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. The, I got too much salt on the butter. <laughs> butter is bad. <laughs> We had to redo it. There's a step called the slap and fold. This is something that it's not... It's burning my hands a little. It's burning your hands? Slightly. Oh, that's not a good sign. <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> Do you want to wash that? No, I, I, it's not bad. I think maybe okay. it's just a... I don't know. All right. Well, I never had that happen to you before. Yeah, it's a little weird. I'm sure you're fine. <laughs> so you're basically uh, going to pick up the dough in one fell swoop and slam it back on the surface. And as you slam it... You fold it onto itself? Kind of let it fold onto itself, Yeah. And you want to hit it, right? Yeah, like you want that's a little, a good sound. little towel. So you don't have to go too overboard on this. Am I? Slap and fold. No, no, keep going. But what I look for in this step is the dough definitely is less slack, so it holds its shape a little better. It doesn't look like a huge amount of dough, but we're going to get two pretty nice sized loaves out of this. So that gives you an indication. Two, uh, of, well, I don't think we're going to do fools this time. Not like last time. What are we going to do? So I'll show you a different shape. A little more of like a football shape. Oh, right in time for the old s***. <laughs> Yeah, right. Aren't we not allowed to say we're not allowed to say? Are you serious? Time for the big game on Sunday. 
One thing I learned from the last time I shot this video, we had Francisco Magoya from, ah, Francisco. from Modernist Bread come in. He recommends proofing your bread in a box like this, something with even lower sides, and giving it a little coat of oil. So we're going to go just straight in here. Right in there, one yep. ball. Yep. So we have it in this box for proofing, and we are entering the phase of the process called bulk fermentation. So we're going to basically let the dough ferment. Mm -hmm. And to do that, it likes a warm place. So we, in the test kitchen, have these electric ovens on the wall that have a proof setting, which puts them at 85 Fahrenheit, which is a pretty good temp for this dough. So we want to cover this. We don't want the dough to form a skin. If it's exposed to air, it'll get a little bit of a skin. And then every 30 minutes, we'll come back and give the dough a series of folds. So as you could see with the sourdough bread, we make the starter and we make the bulk of the bread and then we bring those two together. And as you can see, they kind of pinch them together uh, to create that dough. Uh, and then after that, they're going to proof it again, as they were just doing at the end of the video there. Uh, and then you form it into the bread uh, and bake it off in a similar kind of way to most other breads. Uh, but that's uh, so that's specifically for sourdough. So the straight dough method is where we actually take all of the various different ingredients that we're going to use to make that particular dough. We mix them together. We're using warm water between 100 and 120 Fahrenheit. We're never going over 120 Fahrenheit because we will kill yeast. Uh, so that's very important. But we want it to be good warm water so it activates that yeast. So it gives that yeast life and so it starts to uh, form its reaction. And so uh, we actually want to have that yeast be nice and warm so it starts to develop. If you take it to 140, it's going to kill that yeast off and it won't be any good to us. If we have dead yeast, then the bread will not rise. It will not leaven. Uh, and also it's going to impact the flavor. Remember when we were talking about the sourdoughs, uh, that giving it time for that uh, yeast to develop will actually give it more flavor. And that's really important for us. Okay, so let's have a quick look at exactly how the straight dough method works. The straight dough method. Begin by combining all the ingredients together in the mixing bowl. Use the dough hook to mix the dough together for about 8 to 10 minutes. The ingredients will start to catch, clinging together in a ball around the hook. Then, remove the dough from the mixer and place it on a lightly floured surface. Knead the dough until it is smooth and springy to the touch. Next, move the dough to a large mixing bowl and place it near a warm place. Allow the dough to rise, doubling in size. Then, remove the dough from the bowl and place on a lightly floured surface. Gently punch the dough down by folding the dough in half and then into quarters. Reform the dough into a ball and punch again, folding into half first, then into quarters again. Scale or size the dough to the appropriate size. Use a dough cutter to cut and divide the pieces. Then, allow the dough to rest on a surface covered for about 15 minutes. Shape the dough into ovals and place into lightly oiled loaf pans. Now that the dough is shaped in the pan, proof the dough by letting it rise a second time in a warm, humid space, such as on top of the oven or in a proofing box. The dough will rise to the top of the pan, forming a shape that is very similar in size to the finished product. Bake at 425 degrees Fahrenheit or 218 degrees Celsius for 20 to 30 minutes. Watch for the crust to turn golden brown. The straight dough method. All right, so when we're looking at the straight dough method, it's a really very simple method where you're literally taking all of the ingredients, mixing them together uh, to create that dough. Uh, so kneading is a big part of making bread. Uh, so this is where we're pressing the ingredients uh, with our hands and stretching it. It develops the gluten. Remember, the gluten is the protein that's naturally in uh, that uh, the high gluten flour that we use to make bread. 
and that's what gives it the stretchiness and the t and the texture and the structure uh, that our breads need to have in order to make bread. And so we're looking for uh, for the ability for us to keep on working that gluten until it gives us the texture that we need. So just to uh, go re-go over this with the straight dough method, we're combining all of the ingredients together. We're mixing the dough. Um, and then once it starts to catch, once it starts to pull together, uh, that's when, uh, you know, as, as one solid uh, mass, then that's when we start to knead that dough. Uh, we want it to be nice and smooth and springy. Uh, we move the dough into an oil, into an oil bowl. And we cover that so that it doesn't form any kind of a skin. We let it rise in a nice warm environment. And then what we're doing, we're punching the dough down. So we're pushing the air, the you know, carbon dioxide bubbles back out of it. This, is in, this encourages it to then rise again to actually produce more carbon dioxide and continue its reaction. Then we're going to scale the dough or size the dough. We're cutting it into matching individual pieces. Um, then we're going to let the dough rest on a floured surface and uh, just so that the gluten can relax a little, but also so that the yeast can continue its reaction. We're going to shape the dough into the specific sizes and shapes that we want it to be, whether it's individual rolls or if we want it to be a full loaf. And we're going to place it into the actual pan itself. As you can see with the uh, photograph over here on the right hand side, uh, this would be for a loaf of bread. And then we're going to proof that bread one last time in the actual uh, pan itself so that, that way it gives it a good rise. And then we're going to bake it until it's golden brown. And what we'll actually find is when we place that into the oven, we'll get one last spring of energy before that yeast is killed at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll get one last spring. So however large your bread has risen to, it will get a little more in that first few minutes of cooking in the oven. Okay, so here is another method of making bread. So this is called the sponge method or the poolish method. Poolish is the French term for it. So this is a little different. It does tend to make a bread uh, that has a little more flavor to it. Um, so this is where we're going to actually mix the yeast, uh, half of the liquid and half of the flour together initially. And we're going to create what we call a sponge or a poolish. Um, so this is almost like where we make the starter for sourdough. So we will allow that to then double in size. We'll let it sit for quite a few hours, maybe overnight, to really let it start to develop. Uh, and then we're going to add all of the uh, other ingredients together uh, and knead that just like we have with all the other doughs and allow that to rise again, to allow that to leaven. Um, so the, the thing that this develops is that more, there's more reaction from the yeast, uh, so it creates a much lighter texture. So this bread will have a lighter texture to it, and it, but it will have a deeper, richer flavor. So it might take longer to make, but you get more flavor from it. Okay, so we're going to join this video here so we can actually take a look at how uh, we create the sponge or the poolish um, and show the, the entire method of the sponge method. It's really delicious and Polish. Obviously, you sound a lot like Polish. It definitely has some Polish origins, but it really became popularized in France. Think baguette. This right here is what baguettes are all about using a Polish. Also, would be really good in focaccia bread in Italy. But regardless, I'm so thankful you guys have stuck with me through all this bread making. I've got a beard. I mean, Seriously, it's been a wild week, early mornings, late nights, and the poolish is a little bit different from the sourdough starter, as you don't need to make it for five days, but it's almost spot on to the viga. As I said, the hydration of the flour mounts are just a little bit different. So without further ado, let's get started on this pool. So to make this poolish, what we're going to do is add some artisan bread flour right to a large bowl. I'm going to, of course, be using Bob's Red Mill. It's a great flour, perfect for bread making, loaded with protein. Next, we're going to sprinkle in just a wee bit of active yeast. And then we're next going to pour in some water that's in between 80 and 82 degrees. 
pour it in there. Give it a really nice mix. Make sure it's completely combined by squeezing and folding. We need that yeast to be completely incorporated so that it has time to do a little fermentation overnight. Once it is combined, go ahead and put the lid on it. Let it sit at room temperature for as little as 10 hours and all the way up to 24 hours. As I stated earlier, a Poolish uses a higher hydration on the upfront. In the big gut, if you remember, we use 45% of the liquid and 50% of the flour because we wanted the flour to provide a lot of those flavors in our big gut. With the Poolish, we use 50% of the flour and 62 percent of that water that's why it's really runny you can see that uh it will literally pour right out if you wanted to don't let that freak you out it's exactly where it needs to be so after you've left it overnight come back you can see that it is beautiful looks like a spider web if you look at it through the side tons of holes poking through here lots of air pockets and if you smell it really that strong alcohol flavor coming right through that leathery sort of smell amazing so now let's get into making this recipe so what we're going to do is add a bunch of bob's red mill whole wheat flour into this this is just going to provide some great flavors to this pool next we're going to finish off with a little more of that bread flour we're next going to sprinkle in our sea salt we're going to add a bit more yeast to this mixture now go over to that poolish. We've got some hot water in between 105 and 107 degrees. Go ahead and pull it right into that poolish. This is gonna sort of help loosen it up around the sides and then just flip it and dump it right over into our bin full of flour, salt, and yeast. And then immediately begin to mix this with your hands very vigorously. Squeeze and pull and fold and squeeze and pull and fold until it is completely combined. This should take three to five minutes for it to be completely mixed in. We do have to do a couple of folds, but first let's go ahead and set the lid on it and let it sit for 20 minutes. After that amount of time, go ahead and come back, take the lid off. We wanna stretch it just before it tears. Don't pull too hard and fold it over. Do this about six to eight turns and times, put a lid on it, and then we're gonna come back in another 20 minutes, do the exact same thing for the next 40 minutes. So three total folds. Just like all of my other recipe videos here, Making Bread, I wanted to give you a little bit more baking knowledge. We've talked about hydration, baker's percentages. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about time and temperatures. While there isn't a perfect math here, you need to be patient. You have to give this dough plenty of time. And not just the foolish, how about the bigger and also the sourdough start of Levon. It takes time, okay? It needs to work to ferment, to break down the flour so it gets that good bacteria in there to break down the gluten so your stomach doesn't have to. That's maybe why there's so much gluten intolerance these days. Now, I'm not perfectly certain, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that it's contributing to it. Also, temperatures. You have to figure your water temperatures when you're pouring in, and then also a final mix temperature. Almost all of your final mix doughs will be in between 70 and 80 degrees. I like to go a little bit on the higher side simply because my studio is a little bit cooler and I just think that the higher temperature it is without being too hot gives the yeast a more opportunity to work and work through that dough. But I want to caution here, okay, because everyone's room temperature is different. If you're in Florida and you like the windows open, I probably wouldn't go as hot as I've been going in a lot of these videos. I'd probably go a little cooler. And if you happen to live in Maine or maybe even Canada and you're a little bit colder up there, that's when you want to up the degrees maybe by one or two points. So I just want to give you all that before we move on to the next step. And also, because we're making a pool, you're probably wondering what that is. It's really just a big, flat ball of dough. Obviously, it's French. Think of boulangerie, which is the bread bakery. This word comes straight from that word, probably actually invented boulangerie. And if you've ever seen those old movies, like I think in Gladiator, where they're throwing bread out to like the audience uh, that's watching them fight in the Coliseum, this looks like what they're doing. I mean, this thing is gigantic. It should feed you for probably a week. And the other cool thing, before we go on to the next episode, sorry, there's so much knowledge we dropping here. A lot of these breads that have the pre-ferments and the sourdough stardom, they're a little bit more acidic, so they can last longer. I mean, probably 8 to 10 days. If you bake homemade bread 8 to 10 days, it's either rock solid, you've got mold growing. 
This is a great bread that'll last you a little longer than the usual thing. So now after that last turn, you want the dough to rest for another two hours, giving it a max rest time of three. It looks beautiful. It's about tripled in size. Now it's time to move it over to our peel. So go ahead and remove it from that bucket on a very heavily floured surface. Now what we want to do is fold it and then form it. So remember, stretch from the top right to the bottom left, the top left to the bottom right, fold it over again and begin cuffing it. That, that motion that kind of works from the top all the way to the bottom, cuffing it underneath, making a beautiful dough ball here. And then what we need to do is move it over to a peel. If not, flip a cookie sheet tray over if you don't have a pizza peel. We're gonna lay down a piece of parchment paper and then we're gonna heavily flour up the top of that. Go ahead and set your dough right over top of it. We're gonna sprinkle it with a little flour, add a kitchen towel to the top, and then we're gonna let it prove for about one hour. It is looking beautiful. So while this is proofing, go over to the oven, lay down a pizza stone right in the bottom of the oven. Push it in. We're going to get it up to 500 degrees, just like all the other bread dough recipes. Let's stop right there. If you don't have a pizza stone, flip over a cookie sheet tray. You can put it on that. It's totally fine. Just preheat it. Make sure it's very, very hot. That is important to this step. What we're going to do is come back over to the bread, take that towel off. You can see this thing is massive already, and I'm going to score it. Feel free to take some slashes, maybe three or four, all the way through the entire top going at about a eh, quarter inch deep or so. I'm going to make little leaves or petals or whatever I want just because I want it to look pretty. So this part is completely up to you. Now go ahead and go over and transfer the dough right on top of the stone. And for a little trick, I've got a huge metal bowl. I'm going to flip it over top and put it right on the stone covering the bread. Push it into the oven. We're cooking covered for 30 minutes at 500. We're gonna take the cover off after that time. We're gonna cook it for another 30 minutes to get it nice and golden brown. And let's stop right there because you may not have a bowl this big. What I'm trying to do is get some moisture in the air because there's already water in the dough when it's covered in those Dutch oven pot tops. And of course, with this bowl, it's steaming and making that bread really tender, moist, getting that nice crust on the outside. This You want to do this with all of your bread. So if you don't have a bowl this big, no problem. Put a pan in the bottom rack of your oven. And then when you put the dough in, throw a couple ice cubes into that pan. It will steam that bread, get sort of that same effect. It will keep it all right there in the oven. Let's take it out, and you can see that this thing is absolutely gorgeous. It's gigantic. It is amazing. So the all important things when we're making our bread, so uh, we're punching it down and so that means that we're expelling that carbon dioxide, we're pushing that out and it helps to redistribute the yeast evenly in there so that, that way it can then proof again, uh, meaning that the yeast then starts to produce more carbon dioxide and makes it rise again. Um, so ideally um, we're going to be trying to make it proof between about 90, uh, 90 Fahrenheit and 115. Obviously we don't want to go too much higher than that, otherwise we're going to kill the yeast. Um, it should come up to about twice its original size, and so when you actually touch on it, it should bounce right back. It should be a nice springy texture. So we have a proofing cabinet that's uh, in our kitchen at school, um, but if you don't have one of those, then you, uh, you can just give it a good warm environment. It may literally be that you cover uh, that bread over and you place it on top of a warm oven uh, so that the warmth that rises up out of the oven keeps that environment warm. But that's what it's looking for is to have a warm, moist um, atmosphere for it to be able to rise properly. So uh, we can also uh, cover that dough uh, in, to make sure that it doesn't get a skin on it. That's really important as well. Otherwise, it does tend to get a, a more leathery texture on top of the bread. So when we're using fresh yeast as opposed to the, uh, the dried powder-based yeast, it's very important. We keep that refrigerated. It's a live thing, and so we want to keep it under control in the refrigerator. Um, it should have a nice creamy and white appearance. It should smell nice and fresh and 
have that nice fresh yeasty type of smell. It should not smell uh, sour. It shouldn't be brown and slimy. We should be discarding it if it's gone to that stage because uh, it's gone bad. It's already over uh, produced and it's, it's gone bad. So some different things that we can do with our breads uh, to add flavors and textures to it is that we can give it a uh, an egg wash or an egg glaze um, and you're, you're literally just taking some egg and uh, egg yolks and breaking those down and brushing it over as we can see over in the photograph over here and once we've brushed it over we can just literally bake it like that and it'll give it a wonderful golden brown uh, glaze color to the top but also what an egg wash will actually do is it can give us uh, the ability to then stick some seeds onto it. You can see the poppy seeds right here, or you can add oats or various other different uh, seeds to the top that will give it more flavor and a completely different texture. So let's look at the important things when we are making yeast breads. So we're always scaling the ingredients. We're measuring the ingredients. It's really important so that we can get consistency and exactly the end result that we wanted to have. We're mixing and kneading the ingredients. As we're kneading the ingredients, we're developing the gluten, which gives it the structure that the bread has. Um, as we're allowing it to be nice in a nice warm and moist environment, uh, then it's going to ferment. It's going to push up as it starts to develop and it starts to rise. We then go and punch it down and that's just to redistribute the yeast and to and to encourage the yeast to produce more carbon dioxide then we're portioning it out into the individual pieces uh, whether that's like bread rolls that you can see at the bottom photograph right here or if it's a full loaf of bread and then we're going to round it off um, as you can see on the top photograph right here we round it off and we shape the dough into the specific shapes that we want that to be whether it's going to be a baguette or if it's going to be an individual bread roll, or a garlic knot, or anything like that. And then we're going to proof it. Uh, we're going to proof it in a nice warm environment to encourage the, uh, the yeast one more time to produce more carbon dioxide and alcohol. It develops the flavor, and that's something that's key when we're making bread. When we use the straight method, that produces bread, however it doesn't have as much flavor. When we're producing sourdough, or if we're doing a poolish, that's giving more time for the yeast to develop, and that's where we're developing more flavor for our bread. So then we're, we're baking the bread at a relatively high temperature, um, somewhere between about 400 and 425 for most bread types. Some of them can be higher, though. Um, and then afterwards, something that's really important, we make, sh make sure that we're cooling that bread down on a cooling rack. It adds air circulation to it so that the outside shell of that bread is able to uh, form a nice crusty edge to it. And we're always cooling it down to room temperature and maintaining it at room temperature. Bread will go stale if you refrigerate it. So it's important we keep it at room temperature and we make sure that once it is cool, we wrap it to stop it from going stale quite so quickly. Bread is freezable. Um, you can freeze it for a couple of months. Uh, any more than that, you will find that it starts to get um, that it starts to get freezer burned and dehydrates, so the quality will actually diminish on there as well. So I know we covered a lot of different things about yeast breads and the different methods that we make them and the different flavors and textures that we can create with them. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions at all, and I will see you in the next chapter. Cheers.